Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, welcome everybody from Washington DC to the world, from the world back to Washington DC. This first ever launch, virtual launch of an issue of uh, the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. A great honor uh, uh, to have this opportunity to, to share poems with you. And uh, we have a great list of great team of poets who will, who will share their work to today and also in the, on the 21st, the second of these readings. You know, we've been living through so many crises of late. And uh, so it was almost inevitable that we took the theme of crises as the, as the theme for our recent issues. Uh, this is the second volume of uh, what we call Art in Times of Crisis. And um, uh, both Sarah and I have been editing the magazine now over the last year and a, and a bit. Uh, we have a great debt to Kim Roberts, who was the founding editor of the Beltway Poetry Quarterly, who, who turned it over to me last year. And then I and Sarah got together and we, we made a team of it. And, um, and, and a team that depends absolutely and completely on you, all of you listening for your contributions and your support, your reading and your writing. And um, we have made some changes to the magazine. It now includes translations. It also includes reviews and it has moved beyond the Beltway to invite poets from all over, all over the world. Um, and we're grateful for that international exposure in what has been times of uh, relatively limited international exposure in the United States, if, if you get my drift. But those times are changing, the times they are changing, and that's a great feeling to know that. My name is Indra Amit and, uh, uh, and we'll kick this off. Sarah, do you want to introduce me and then and I'll read a poem and then we can go from there. Sure. Um, uh, so Indrin, Indrin has authored 19, um, first my name is, is Sarah Merritt, I'm the associate editor of uh, The Beltway, uh, Indrin and I, one part of the team. Uh, Indrin has authored 19 poetry collections, including most recently The Migrant States, um, and Indrin, I don't want to mispronounce this, Sir, Sir Leil Nostalgic, close, Lyrica a Tiempo, The Elephant yeah. Brooklyn. Um, he's, the he's the 2020 Foundation for the Contemporary Arts Fellow in Poetry. He won the Patterson Prize for the Elephants of Reckoning, and he edits uh, with me the Beltway, Beltway Poetry Quarterly. He has received fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the U.S.-Mexico Fund for Culture, and the McDowell Colony. And Indrin will read a poem. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I've been working on a new manuscript, and one of the poems in the book in the manuscript is called In Love and Politics. I miss you now more than I did yesterday and a whole lot more than a month ago. This accumulating, sometimes leaping, desiring, dizzying desire is splendid, grand, and gives me almost infinite energy. But to where is our train hurtling? Are we riding in Lawrence's Coney Island of the mind? The America he observed then a year before I was born. And this America today, when will it fulfill the dream? Every Sunday when I go to see my brother, I pass a line of cars a few miles long outside a church on Randolph Road. The drivers wish to satisfy hunger waiting for them at their homes in this time of virus, lost jobs, not enough money to pay mortgage or rent. I have read about soup kitchens, the Great Depression, dust, scrabble, have seen Henry Fonda play Jode in the Grapes of Wrath, but to see ordinary people hungry now in automobiles, to see shooting in the back of black men on grainy police cams, to see George Floyd, his life pressed out. There is something rotten in America. Shakespeare wrote once about Denmark, there's something awry in the pigsty, a ferret in the coop, a bandicoot, a rat, a snake. There is something not right on one side of the debate stage. Yet there is enormous hope, belief in the good and in loving kindness. The man, senator, widower, his wife killed in a car crash, 
who rode Amtrak every morning to Washington, every evening back to Delaware to join his children for dinner and to put them to bed. This ordinary, decent Joe has my vote and will soon have a new name and title, Extraordinary Joe, Extraordinary President. Shall we take the Metro to the mall, get off at the Smithsonian, walk together to find a patch of grass, lay down a blanket in our mind, a carousel, a pretzel stand, then raise our hands in glee on the Ferris wheel, reciting poetry on Inauguration Day. That's in love and politics. Um, and for the dream being restored. And now, uh, with great pleasure and with great gratitude, enormous gratitude, I would like to introduce to you Sarah Cahill Marin. Marin. She is um, an amazing poet, an amazing editor, with whom uh, this the editing of the journal has become almost as uh, tasty as drinking coconut water from the a young coconut in, in my home country of Ceylon. Beautiful, beautiful experience working and working back and forth with the poets on, on the selections. Sarah Cahill Marin is the author of Reasons for the Long Tomb, published by Broadstone Books. Nothing you build here belongs here, forthcoming from Kelsey Books. And Call Me Spez, forthcoming in 2022 from Mad Hat Press. She is the associate editor of Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Her work has been published widely in literary magazines and journals such as Gravel, Atlas, Plus, Alice, Meniscus, Cordelia, Newtown Literary, South Florida Poetry Journal, West Trade Review, Lunch Ticket, and other anthologies. You can see uh, her work at, at www.sarahcahillmarin.com. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Um, and I was going to read something published, but since um, most of the participants here have trusted both Indran and I with their unpublished work, I'm going to read you guys something that I have not published yet. So this is a, an erasure poem called Powers of an Encroaching Nature from FDR's first inaugural address written at a time of um, when we were editing the, the first crisis issue. My fellow Americans, Time to speak truth, endure, revive, assert. Fear is itself less reasoning terror, paralyzing national life. You support leadership, shrunken taxes, rising income, frozen trade, withered leaves. Beside farmers finding no markets for their produce, savings in thousands gone grim. Toil, foolish optimist, deny dark realities, momentary distress. Stricken by plagues of locust, Perils our forefathers multiplied, stubbornness and incompetence, admitted failure, indicted by hearts of men. Tradition faced by failure, lending more money, stripped self-seekers, no vision, no vision, people perish. True, they have tried, material wealth, high pride, personal profit, callous confidence thrives on honesty, honor, sacredness. This work, evils of the old order, is the way, is immediate, is world policy. The good neighbor resolutely respects, is respect, is trained, is loyal, submits lives to leadership, attacking common form, ancestors, a constitution essentially itself, most superbly, enduringly political, Mechanism modern, met every stress, vast expansion, foreign wars, bitter strife, world relations, these measures measure experience, authority and emergency, still critical, I shall not evade, clear course, duty then confronts me, crisis, but broad executive power, a war against great power, given to me, in fact, foe. Trust in me, I return, I do less. Arduous lies in clear consciousness of old, precious values, stern performance, duty by old and young alike. 
assurances of permanent life, distrust future, democracy, the people have not failed. They mandate, they ask, they present. I take it, a nation of gods to come. Uh, and that is from the Roosevelt inaugural address from March 4th, 1933. Uh, and I think we will present all the poets now, starting with uh, Andrew. You can take it away. I think you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm not, I'm unmuted now. Um, Okay, we're, we're going to begin uh, uh, from the reading, uh, inviting Ada Zapata Ariaran. Um, Ada Zapata Ariaran is a poet from Bolivia, a writer, essayist, and cultural journalist, a graduate of literature from UMSA, the public university in La Paz. She has published Fragmentos in el aire, Fragments of the Air, She's also a film critic and has co-edited the book Apuntes de Cine, uh, Film Notes. She is a curator of the journal Ablusionistas. And since 2002 to date, she has edited the art digital journal Palabras Mas, of which she is also co-founder. She has published many articles in newspapers and journals. Uh, adelante, Ada. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Eh, bueno, voy a leer el eh, primer poema eh, titulado El sueño del mundo. Las luciérnagas en tus manos devorando los días, la tortura en la barca del cuerpo. Nada es terrible, todo ha sucedido. El sueño sin cabeza era una montaña imposible, los perros ladrando en la oscuridad. Se debe morir para poder morir, dijo con ansiedad del sueño. Así, solo así, olvidar la sombra que vuela, la familia en la casa oscura, todos esos días, esos días, esas noches interminables. El niño que fuiste corre por el patio, no sabe que estás muerto. Ya no somos lo que somos y no se puede salir de los sueños. Eres, me dijo el imposible viaje de una estrella. Y los recuerdos siguen jugando, saltando precipicios, dos veces para poder morir, como dijo aquella tarde el sueño del mundo, sus cabellos rojos sobre la mesa de la cocina, el sonido inaudible invadiendo, cerrando colinas, y la oscuridad cubrió mi cabeza. Gracias. Thank you, Ed, just one? Good. Uh, then I would like to invite uh, Enrique Bernales to the mic. Uh, Enrique was born in Lima in 1975. He's a Peruvian author, a cultural promoter. He has a PhD in Latin American literature from Boston University. Currently, he is an associate professor of Spanish at the University of Northern Colorado. He publishes in the New York-based magazine, Vice Versa, short stories, poems, reviews, and urban chronicles on a weekly basis. Enrique. Thank you so much, dear friends. I am very happy to be with you and to share poetry and love to everybody. And this is special moments in humanity. There are many changes in the world and Peru, Chile, many countries, uh, United States. And now I want to share some of my poets, poems. And I want to start with the one that Gently, uh, my dear Indra and the review that he managed uh, Bellwell Poetry was kindly uh, agreed to publish. Shock. Um, May God help us, said the little man on television. And so the war was made flesh. The free market was bearded in pain on our shores and in living among us never to live again. I turning off the TV or the TV turning off me alone. Of this last part, I don't recall much. 
I threw myself against the black flesh of my bed, the sky blue walls, the cries in flames as the room that had belonged to my parents gained greater height. And the wounds in the, side, in the ceiling multiply, absorb on a pinhole, I then began to take shape and sustains. I began to cry and from the ceiling lying and plaster fell into my eyes. I turned off the lights in the room I, and went out to the street. That night night, there was a night silence in the city, the hills, the sea, the entire country. We were a sick land in need. With lying and plaster covering our faces, the perfect tie wearing technicians with doctorates from the United would tell us we more lying on their teeth than we had, that this was the longest night of the year and no one wanted daybreak to arrive. That night could have been the end of the world and everyone was content to stay in their black beds until morn. But no, it was only the longest night of the year and we were not in Alaska to be precise on the foreheads of neighbors who cried and consolable, there was dust and plaster too. And I'm gonna read the second poem that, thank you so much. Then I'm going to uh, read it for my country, my homeland, Peru. Uh, this poem was published in, the, in a book that I published this year, seventh poem. Uh, the title is My Homeland. My homeland doesn't exist. There are pink dolphins there. There are men who eat cats or pineapples so big that could block the sun. My homeland doesn't exist. It's the accent figure of my father. My homeland doesn't exist. I come from myself. I am speaking dolphins, the head trinkle carnival, the Nazca lines, the light in my eyes. My homeland doesn't exist. I am my homeland. It starts in the north, very close to the Equator, Equator line, or rather on the hero's ends of my hair. It ends in the south, in Tacna, in the border with Chile, or I choose saying some nail of my left foot. The political capital of my homeland is no Lima, but my heart. Its population is one at the most. It lacks an official religion and doesn't even have a coin of its own. It was born from primal clay, a product of sperm and egg that came out of bigger countries. My homeland is just in South America, hardly watched by the immense foam of the Pacific Sea, one day my homeland will die. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. I apologize. I interrupted Ada from reading her second poem. I'd like to invite Ada back to the mic to finish reading, if you would like. Ada, si quieres, uh, puedes leer tu segundo poema. Ada's muted, I believe. She has to unmute herself. Ada, tú puedes... Uh, yeah. uh, Okay. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias. El poema que voy a leer es muy corto. Eh, se llama eh, Y la tarde se duerme. Y la tarde se duerme apoyando el cuello contra las gradas. En el rincón de los silencios, el diablo juega conmigo. En la isla del cuerpo, en la espalda, sin estrechar, donde se abandona lo que se repite al abrazo de las olas, sin poder estar. Muchas gracias, Ada. Uh, and now I'll read uh, the translation of that poem. Uh, it's called, 
in the version of the translator, and the afternoon falls asleep. And the afternoon falls asleep, resting its neck against the steps in the corner of silences. The devil plays with me in the island of the body, in the unnarrowed back, on the back that hasn't been hugged, where you abandon what repeats itself to the embrace of the waves, unable to stay. The translation by Mauricio Navia. Mucha gracias, Seda. Thank you very much for your beautiful poems. Um, I, uh, Sarah, do you want to introduce the next? Uh, yes, uh, Luis Bravo is the next poet that we'll invite to the mic. Uh, Mon he's from Montevideo. He's a poet, essayist, researcher, and university professor. Since 1984, he has published books, CD-ROMs, CDs, DVDs, and in keeping with the in keeping with the multimedia of his poetic art. His most recent book is La Voz y la Sombra, Voice and Shadow, from the po uh, publisher New Orleans Lavender Inc. in 2020. He's bilingual, translated by uh, Catherine Yago and Jesse Lee Kirchival. Uh, he's an award-winning Sydney-based Irish, who are award-winning and Sydney-based Irish poets and writers. Uh, Luis Bravo. Uh, Luis, estás estás de activar tu micrófono. Luis. Luis, no puedo. Uh, yeah. Now. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Indran and Sarah for the setting of this event and also Don for your collaboration. It's a pleasure to participate in the launch of Bellwell Quarterly. Uh, we are going to begin with the reading of, of the first poem. Uh, I will read in Spanish and then Catherine, Diego, uh, the translation. Um, and the other poem, La Crecida, is the last poem I incorporate into the book and uh, uh, Jesse Lee will read the English translation. Llorando en crudo. No soy solo un hombre que llora solo. Soy un hombre que llora y al llorar es otra vez niño. Soy el niño que llora en el hombro de su propio hombre. Estas palabras están húmedas. Lloro mientras escribo. El llanto arde en los ojos. Es un dolor líquido como el tiempo que perdimos. No es poético el llanto de un hombre. Como la poesía, este llanto ya no tiene la menor importancia. No me celebro. Llora el cuerpo del hombre de cabo a rabo. No hablo hoy de las mujeres que ya suficiente trabajo han llorado. Hay un llorante sentado sobre una pequeña piedra de arenisca y otro llanto chamuscado en el bucle eléctrico del alambre de púas. No tiene casa, pecho ni hombre a donde regresar el llanto huérfano. Ese llora atrapado entre el pasado y el futuro. Le fue arrebatado el pasaporte del presente. No le dejarán entrar a otra vida sino a la huesa herida de la frontera. Se pregunta si hizo mucho, poco o nada para merecer lluvia de odio. Se oye el sórdido silencio de los hombres de hierro que vigilan su llanto. De millones de hombres que lloran está hecho este silencio. Es un silencio que tiembla apenas como el llanto avergonzado de los viejos. De pronto llora el cielo rayos láser que dan directo en el corazón de tiza de sangrado bajo los escombros del salón de clases de una escuela. Un puerto despiadado cubre de agua envenenada el llanto náufrago. El hombre llora a mares en un mar de lágrimas como granos de arena. Viaja el llanto en trenes subterráneos. Llanto de voces sin aliento transporta el metro a diario 
nadie quiere ni tiene con quién hablar. El llanto es con nadie hablar. Indecible jadeo de tren nocturno perdiéndose en la historia. En un rincón de la ciudad suena alucinado el aullido de las sirenas. Sus chillidos ensartan las venas de las calles y las horas. Entonces, entonces hay hombres para salvar hombres, pero de pronto esa épica se derrite en llanto. Crece sordo de los hombres el llanto que no pudieron salvar del hombre. Un llanto muerto llega hermético, trofeo, en carro negro, y ahí el llanto del perro baleado a pleno sol como un hombre. El perro que perdió a su hombre entre las llamas del infierno. El reptil humano entre las piedras del desierto y el llanto de hombre pétreo con ojeras de cocodrilo. Nadie ve en el rostro humano el rastro del llanto animal. Este es el mar de los hombres que lloran. Esta noche es posible oír el llanto de los planetas sin rumbo. No están muertos, lloran como si lo estuvieran. Soy un hombre sin luz propia entre millones de estrellas. Ellas lloran por la felicidad que les ha sido a los hombres arrebatada. Unos la tenían y no supieron hasta perderla. Vano lloriqueo. A quienes nunca la tuvieron les ha sido igualmente denegada. Hay una flota de lágrimas a la deriva en el mar de este llanto. Aquí rechinan hombre, niño y poeta juntos en la grimal trifurca. Los hombres rotos y los que no lo están ninguno es ya humano. Esos hombres y yo por diverso cauce estamos en llanto ungidos. Y nadie ama a los hombres que lloran. El llanto es la única propiedad por la que ningún hombre mataría a otro. Soy el hombre que llora a hombres antes que ellos se beban su propio llanto. Un mundo en el que los hombres lloran sin saber que lloran ni por qué. El mar de los hombres llora a lo largo del pequeño mundo de los hombres. Anda, dije, deja de llorar como un crío. Niño extraviado en el laberinto del hombre por el hombre extraviado. Juntos, los hombres que han sabido llorar en busca de los ojos niños. Ahora mismo, hijos del hombre, ahora, sin más llantos, ni tardanza. Thank you. Um, I think Catherine. I, I think I, I think Catherine. Thank you. Man crying, raw footage. I'm not only a man who cries when he's alone. I'm a man who cries whose crying makes a boy of him once more. I'm the boy who cries in the mansion of his own man. These words are soppy. I'm crying as I write. Crying makes the eyes burn. It's pain that's liquefied like lost time. A grown man crying is no poetic matter. Like poetry, crying doesn't matter in the least nowadays. I'm not boasting. A man bawls his balls out. I'm not talking about women who've worked hard crying. There's a sniveller perched on a little chunk of sandstone and more electrocuted crying dangling from a barbed wire fence. Orphaned, homeless, with no breast or man to turn to. This crying trapped between the past and future, its passport to the present confiscated not allowed in any life but the open grave of the border. It wonders just how much it did to deserve the reign of hate. You can hear the sordid silence of steely men who suppress their crying. That silence is made up of millions of men who cry. It's a silence that trembles like the shame-faced crying of the aged. 
Suddenly the sky cries laser beams that go straight to the heart of bloodless chalk amid the ribble, rubble of a classroom. A pitiless port covers the crying wreck with poisoned water. Men cry rivers into a sea of tears like grains of sand. Crying travels on underground trains. The crying of breathless voices transported by the subway every day. No one wants to talk, even if there were someone to talk to. Crying is talking to no one. The unspeakable panting of a night train disappearing into history. In a corner of the city, the shrieking of the sirens is a delirious dream. Their screams thread the veins of the streets and the hours. So there are men out there to save men, and suddenly that epic dissolves in tears. The crying of men who couldn't save crying from man swells soundlessly. That black purse bears the hermetic trophy of muffled crying. Here's the crying of a dog gunned down in blazing sunlight like a man. The dog who lost his man among the flames of hell. The human reptile among the stones in the desert and the crying of a stony man with puffy crocodile eyes. No one sees the trace of animal crying in the human face. This is the sea of men who cry. Tonight, you can hear the wandering planets crying. I'm a lightless man among millions of stars. They're crying for the joy men are deprived of. Some have felt joy, but didn't know until they lost it. Pointless sniveling. Those who've never felt joy were also denied it. There's a fleet of tears floating around the sea of crying. Man, boy, and poet are lumped together in a grating lacrimal strifurcate. Whether men are broken or they aren't, none of them are human. Both men and I are all in different ways awash in tears. And no one loves men who cry. Crying is the only possession for which no man would kill another. I'm the man who cries for men before they swallow their own tears. A world in which men cry without knowing it or why. The sea of men crying throughout men's little world. For crying out loud, I said, stop sniveling like a little kid. Little boy lost in the labyrinth of manhood, in the madness of mankind. Come together, men who cry for a child's gaze. Right now, sons of man, with no more crying or procrastination. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Me? Yes. Uh, uh, I think we're going to hear now from, thank you so much, Louise and Catherine. Thank, I will hear from Jesse Lee Kershaw. Uh, first, it's going to be Louise reading the original in Spanish. Oh, and then sorry. I'll read okay. It. okay. Go ahead. Louis. Okay. This is a shorter one. Uh, it names La Crescida and has a, an epigraph that says, it's 10 veces más de lo que se ve, lo que trae el iceberg. Es solo cuestión de agua y tiempo la crecida. Suenan palabras, navegan fuera de sí. Llovería a cántaros y eso hipnotiza o villa. Ocurre sin prisa. Pasa un carruaje, útero sideral, reza el cartel. ¿Por qué no? Dices al zamullirte en el punto helado. Lo gris del verde enciende y fluye sin fin, al fin, al fin, fluir, ah, desatado mar de imaginar, ah, donde late el zinc, brilla la sonora enredadera mientras recoges los fantasmas crecidos como hongos durante la noche. Ahora la ciudad y el mar frente a frente, uno en lugar del otro. Altos edificios navegan lentos entre automóviles ojerosos y paraguas boquiabiertos se mecen entre cuerpos flotantes amarillentos. 
El muelle de piedra desata a la serpiente, abraza el sol en la copa huérfana de los árboles. Al ruido de motores sucede el silencio, una fúnebre bendición. No es este el carozo de la profecía, solo la cáscara del fruto. En mantel celestial, abuelo prepara té con una nube de leche. Lo que vino a decirse se hundió como raíz ande hubo especie. Chamuscado, iceberg, de un rostro con rastros sapiens. Disculpe, doña Blanca, la flor violeta del gallo canta al albor. Entre las cinco húmedas hojas de la mano hubo pétalo de luz, fogonazo de voces en la marea ingente de la lengua. Sobre mar enjollado de plásticos y aceite, oh viejo océano, silva sin fin ni fin al fin, fuelle destartalado el corazón del viento. En ventosas de pulpo se esparce la notación del neuma. Ya es el profeta clavado en la esquina sus tres ojos insomnes. Espanta la sombra y el zumbido de palabras en derredor. Un cardumen de sirenas entona letanías en las rocas del gran estuario. Oigan, es solo cuestión de tiempo y agua la crecida. ¿eh? Pronostican para esta madrugada y todas las siguientes. Thank you very much. I want to thank Sarah and Indran. This is a very special event because um, this lovely book, which is uh, a selection of all of, um, of um, from all the books that um, uh, Luis Bravo has published in his life, plus some uh, new poems, new and selected, was published last spring. And because of the pandemic, uh, he hasn't been able to get a book. <laughs> we haven't been able to have yeah, a real flesh book <laughs> launch. Catherine and I were supposed to go to Montevideo and do that. We haven't been able to bring him here. But at least the poetry can you know, travel via Zoom everywhere in the world. So I just want to show you it's an absolutely gorgeous book and available widely in the United States. <laughs> so um, uh, let, me, let me read the version in English. As I said, this is one of the new poems from the new and selected. Rising waters. The principle says the iceberg is 10 times bigger than you can see. The water rising is just a matter of rain and time. The words echo, sailing beyond themselves. It could pour with rain, hypnotic, unhurried, making you want to curl up. A carriage passes, starry womb, the billboard says. Why not? You say as you dive into the choppy sea, the gray and green ignites and flows endlessly, flowing in the end. O oh, sea of imaginings unleashed, where the tin roof throbs, the tangle of sound gleams as you collect the ghosts that have popped up like mushrooms ever night. Now the city and the sea are facing off, one in each other's space. Skyscrapers swim slowly among the careworn cars, open mouth umbrellas rock among the floating sallow bodies. The stone jetty releases the serpent, the sun blazes, blazes in the orphan treetops. Silence succeeds the noise of engines, a dismal blessing. This is not the pit of prophecy, just the rind of the fruit. On a sky blue cloth, cloth, grandpa is making tea with a spot of milk. What he came to say has drowned like a root where there was a species, scorched iceberg of a face with homo sapien features. Forgive me, white goddess, does the rooster's purple flower crow at daybreak? Among the five white leaves of the hand, there's a petal of light. A blinding flash of voices on this massive tide of tongues, on the sea bejeweled with plastics and oil, O oh, ancient ocean, wheeze on forever, ramshackle bellows of the wind's heart. An octopus's arms conduct the music of the breath. The prophet lies dead, shot down on the corner, his three eyes sleepless. The shadow and the words buzz around it, to inspiring terror. A school of mermaids sings litanies on the rocks of the great estuary. The water rising is just a matter of rain and time, says the forecast, forecast for this morning and for those to come. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Catherine and Jesse Lee for your presence and your readings. Thank you very much. 
Thanks to all three of you. And um, I just wanted to read the two bios of the translators. Catherine Jago is a ATA certified Spanish English, English translator and an award-winning poet and essayist. She has a PhD in Spanish literature from the University of Cambridge, has translated fiction and poetry from Spain, Argentina, and Uruguay. Publication credits include numerous literary journals such as American Poetry Review, Drunken Boat, and Modern Poetry and Translation. And Jesse Lee Kirchival, who we just heard from, is a poet and writer whose recent books include poetry collections uh, such as America, That Island Off the Coast of France. She is the winner of the Dorset Prize. She's also a translator specializing in Uruguayan poetry. She is currently the Zona Gale, uh, correct me if I mispronounced that, Zona Gale Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the next poet that we'll hear from is Tara Campbell. Her website is www.terracampbell.com. She's a writer, fiction teacher, or writer, teacher, fiction editor at Barrel House and an MFA graduate from American University. Her publication credits include Smoke Long Quarterly, Master's Review, Jellyfish Review, Booth, Strange Horizons, and Craft Literary. She's the author of a novel, Tree Evolution, and three collections, Circe's Bicycle, Midnight at the Orang, and Political AF, a rage collection, which I love that title. Sarah? Thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Indran, for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing reading today. I've really enjoyed hearing folks' uh, work so far, and I look forward to more. Um, I will start, I'll just read two poems, and I'll start with the one that was just recently published um, at Beltway Poetry. Um, topical, as you'll hear. Uh, it's called Why I Couldn't Sleep Until Morning. Because my heart wouldn't stop punch bagging my lungs, because my brother told me someone at work tested positive for that thing that's too current to write about if you're creating art. That morning, I dreamt about my dead mother in my childhood home, adrift in a hot pink room with a television blaring homicide. So-and-so's coming Thursday, my dead mother said. So-and-so's coming Friday, all of us gathering like we do for holidays or for death. His coworkers quarantined now, but my head feels hot and I ask my brother when he'll get tested, by which I mean how long until my brain can stop chasing these nightmares, Ouroboros eating its own calamitous self. And I think about how they share a workspace, but not at the same time, he hastened to tell me, and they wipe everything down between shifts. But between us, we don't talk about the virus and enclosed spaces and air. I'm still waiting to hear his test results and wondering why I dreamt about murder when my mother died of old age. And I know it's because of those who have led us to it is what it is, to avoidable equals acceptable risk, to essential equals expendable workers, to number one in the world. So to hell with art, I'm writing. So that is uh, what currently appeared in Beltway Poetry. And um, the second work I will read is from my collection, Political AF, a rage collection. I just answered my question, maybe why the hot pink room, perhaps, who knows? <laughs> um, but uh, at first I was gonna read some doom poetry, but now I think in light of recent events, we deserve some hopeful poetry. So um, I'll read this selection uh, called In Contradiction to the Commander's Standards and Wishes. And some of you may recall a few years ago when uh, folks at the CDC were advised to avoid certain words and phrases to be sure that their funding would be kept intact. So this poem is written in honor of those um, specific words and phrases. I base my poetry on science in contradiction to the commander's standards and wishes. I sing of diverse transgender fetuses, write evidence-based verse in praise of science-based wonders, rhyme vulnerable 
with beautiful. While capital millionaires line their pockets with non-chlorophyllic green and almost forget to chip the children in their trickle-down amnesia. I base my poetry on science in consideration with community standards and wishes, based on faith in reason, in empathy, in data, in compassion, in knowledge, in questioning, in resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. What wonderful work. And I'm, um, I just want to add, I mean, because Tara was one of the co-organizers of the Zoomathon uh, that just took place in October. There were three readings that we organized with others uh, and we had poets from all over the country, a wonderful reading, and raised 10,000 odd dollars for the Biden, Harris, and for the Democrats. And, and she developed these um, art of it. I don't know if she has one at hand that she can show us, but, uh, or they've all been given away. <laughs> oh, yes, there they are. There they Those are, lips. angry lips. Yes, angry this, lips. Was, this was one of the uh, thank you gifts for donations. Um, and I separately am still uh, encouraging donations to uh, Democratic uh, candidates or any sort of social justice causes. Um, my website contains more information about how to uh, get one of these bad boys for yourself. And I'll put my website in the chat. So in case folks feel still feel like donating to uh, social justice, um, there is something in it for you besides knowing you're donating for social justice. So thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, and now um, it gives me great pleasure. Un grand plaisir pour présenter Samim Denise Lautour. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce the next poet, my friend, uh, our friend, Denise Lauturi. A son of humble peasants, Denise left Haiti in 1968. He was a machinist, a welder. He had not graduated from high school when he, when he left. He continued these professions in the United States. And then he went to the City College of New York and he received a BA in sociology an MS in bilingual education, and later an MA in Spanish literature. And he, he's, a, he's an American dream story. He, um, he graduate studies at Fordham and at the Graduate Center. Uh, he writes in Haitian Creole, in English and French. He's published 11 books. He's going to read uh, in French, and then he'll be, the translation will be read by the wonderful Keith Cohen, poet and translator. Um, Denny say, go ahead. Denny say, Chue, Chue la. Um, yes. Okay, go ahead, Denny say. You can read now. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour. And Thank you to Keith Cohen, who says something for the first time. He translated my poetry. Thank you to Adrian and Sarah and all of you who are here sharing this wonderful moment with me. And I'm very happy to listen to your wonderful poetry, your wonderful poem. Keep writing. I am going to read a poem uh, written in the 1980, published in Facebook, Les Dars Empoisonnés du Denizen. Kit has translated the poem. He will read the translation after I read the French. Le cauchemar des feuilles. Mm -hmm. 
Les œufs contenant les vermines triangulaires sont éclos. Les nouveaux monstres de l'histoire tournent, tournent en rond, braquant leurs angles terminalistes sur les aubes des plus beaux boutons de rose. Maudite soit cette nuit où le cosmos en ruine a avalé le sperme fatal. Et maudite soit cette cervelle naïve qui a procédé à la déténébration du terrible rejeton. Il a accouché la synthèse des fous, le triangle des démons, la conification de l'enfer. Les déserts brûleront et resteront déserts. Mais qui racontera le cauchemar des feuilles? Tourne, tourne, météore d'amour, au magnétisme irrésistible, sorti l'on ne sait où des ténèbres, tu éternises la plaite des rocs, les soubresauts des abîmes, et c'est certain que tu éterniseras les hurlements effrayants de la dernière torche animale. Tourne, tourne, et pour le millénaire du silence, retiens aussi le cauchemar des feuilles. Si le papillon se remue trop dans ses rêves. Si la rosée est un peu trop drue, si la brise du soir Denise? Denise, can you hear us? Uh, it looks like he's falling. Uh, no, he's still here. Maybe give him a second to, yeah. maybe he'll kick off and come back. Is he still connected? Looks like the internet is a problem with the internet connection, huh? Yeah, I'll give him a call separately. Meanwhile, Keith, would you like to go ahead and um, and read the poem in English? Um, let he's calling me let's, separately. Let's Let wait. Me... Let's wait just another few seconds because okay. he's doing such a beautiful job with the sonorities of his poem. Yeah, it's kind of um, anticlimactic to listen to it after I read the translation. Yeah, I, should simply, I should simply point out that Denise and I did not practice together. So I'm not able to sing in between stanzas the way he does. He, he definitely got disconnected. He's, he's, he's disappeared from the room, at least for the moment. Let's see. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. He, well, then I guess I have no choice but to read the translation. And then when he re-enters, he could start where he left off. What do you think? Give Indrin one moment. I think they just spoke on the phone. Oh. Uh, he's trying. He actually asked if Keith could read, and then he'll come back. But I have to. I think That's he's coming back in. Is he coming back in now? Can you see? That's why I got that computer. 
I hear his voice. Yeah, that's on my phone. Um, oh. Okay, well, if you can't come back in. Uh, Keith, I think you should go ahead and read the English and I will keep trying to work with him separately yes, on the I phone, okay? See if we can get back in, all right? Okay. Great. Okay. As uh, I pointed out, um, Denise was doing a wonderful job of sort of humming um, a melody in between stanzas and it emphasizes the sonorities of his poem. Um, I have not been able to come up with the an equivalent sonority in my translation, but I've done the best I've done the best I can with the imagery, which is very ni nightmarish. The leaves nightmare. The eggs containing triangular vermin are hatched. The new monsters of history turn circle around, aiming their endpoint angles at the fairest rosebud's dawns. A curse upon this night when the cosmos in heat swallowed the fatal sperm, and a curse upon this naive brain that carried out the, under, the undarkening of the horrible offspring. It gave birth to the synthesis of madmen the triangle of the demented, the douchebagging of hell. Deserts will burn and remain deserted, but who will tell the tale of the leaves nightmare? Turn, turn, meteor of love with the irresistible magnetism arisen who knows where out of darkness. You perpetuate the rocks groaning the jolts of the abysses, and it is certain that you will perpetuate the fearsome howling of the last animal torch. Turn, turn, and for the millennia of silence, remember, too, the leaves' nightmare. If the butterfly stirs too much in its dreams, if the dew is a bit too heavy, if the evening breeze is a little too brisk, Dawn finds us, fallen leaves. If the bird on the branch flaps its wings too much, if the rain gets too heavy, if the wind becomes a bit incensed, dawn finds us, scattered leaves. At the first frigid breath of autumn, with the first snowflake that falls, even before the first freeze, we are already dead leaves. If the sky becomes dry for two or three days, if the sun rays are in erection from one day to the next, and if lightning, like an electrocuting orgasm, grazes us, we are already burnt leaves. When the rivers are rolling furnaces, when the atmosphere is one immense veil of fire, when the oceans are boiling gulfs, what will become of us, the most fragile newborns on earth? Marvelous. Thank you, Thank you. so much, Keith. Um, let me just uh, tell you that Keith was very kind to, to do exactly what we requested, which was give us a very short bio. His bio is, of course, much longer, but uh, let me just say that he's a writer and translator author of natural settings and various short stories, translator of Love of the Medusa and the History of Virility. He's also a, a co-director of DC Alt, an association of literary translators in Washington, DC in the Beltway. And uh, very grateful, Keith, for your amazing translation of Denise's work. We'll keep trying to get Denise back on, uh, but um, I don't believe he's back yet. and. Uh, so we will keep going. And then uh, if we can get Denise back on, we will have him read. And if Sandri, if it's not possible, I'll see if I can put him on the phone and, and, and he can read the poem. He could always All do right. that, right. 
Right. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, from uh, strength to strength, you know, our next uh, reader is a, is a very, very fine poet and a very, very fine translator and also a key figure in the uh, DC Alt in, in the Association of Translators I just mentioned, but, uh, and in Alta and, 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 and a mover and shaker in the world of literary translation in America, uh, Nancy uh, Naomi Carlson and a good friend. Um, she is twice an NEA grant recipient, has published 10 titles, six of them translated. An Infusion of Violets from Seagull in 2019 is her latest in English. It was called New and Noteworthy by the New York Times, and it was reviewed by the Washington Post, which is no small feat. Nancy, Naomi Carlson, go ahead. Uh, Nancy, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, Indran, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, audience, for being here, and thank you, fellow readers. This is poetry blowing me away in that French. Oh, my gosh. So I have to follow that. Uh, no translation from me today, just 33 lines of Villanelle and a sonnet. Uh, so the Villanelle came about in the last two weeks. It's new, but it follows a very sad occurrence of losing my sister-in-law to cancer. There's so much loss going around and um, it seems like there's extra loss on top of the loss. And for me, a, a dark poet, um, it gives me a lot to write about, but it also, and I think it also gives me something to turn to to cushion the feelings that I have. And the Villanelle with its strict pattern of repeated lines and a rhyme pattern, though I break a lot of it, helps me. So for this one, I hope I can get across orally the difference between violence, violence, brutality, bad things, and violets, the flowers. Everything in nature contains its violence. For Roxanne Miller, February 19th, 1949 to November 1st, 2020. Everything in nature contains its violence. Honeybees trading lives for stings. Electromagnetic waves beheaded for violets. The human voice can shatter a glass of wine thanks to sound waves and resonant frequencies. Everything in nature contains its violence. Hydrangea globes laced with cyanide. Fresh killed cattle gut strings for violins. Wavelengths of yellow and green rejected by violets, those ancient flowers of mourning. Like Whitman's eye, they contradict themselves, contain multitudes. Does everything in nature contain its violence? Like a teratoma you always had, the kind with hair, teeth, muscle, and bone that suddenly grows? Nothing to stop the malignant wave spreading like violets, coming back wild each spring, rhizomes finding their way underground, roots shooting out of nodes to form wave after wave of invading violets. Not everything in nature contains its violence. Thank you. Now a bit more cheery. This is the poem that's in the Beltway issue. Um, you remember Shahrazad, and that's the ultimate lockdown. She was stuck in there for a thousand and one nights and she was gonna be beheaded if she couldn't say, tell a new story. And in the beginning, there's a beautiful, um, Rimsky Korsakov put it to music and there's a beautiful violin solo, which thanks to Zoom, I'm going to see if I can get that. Uh, 20 seconds of this violin solo, if I did it right, of Scheherazade, which inspired this poem, this sonnet, 
that was composed about the first day of lockdown. Lockdown Obad on Rimsky Korsakov's birthday. This violin solo teases the spring air, undulates like a veil and shimmies to a high G, the leitmotif for Scheherazade, conjuring concubines, sailors, and rocks to save her life from her sultan husband, who sure all women ring false and flighty. To secure their undying affection, he orders the death of each of his virgin brides, beheaded the morning after the wedding vows. Accompanied by harp arpeggios for 1,001 nights, the blue sultana weaves cords into tails within tails, whirlpools within seas. And now on our first of untold quarantine days, may we be sustained by a handful of plucked strings. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That's such a beautiful poem. Uh, and I love that you played the actual music and thank you for that. Um, what a gift Zoom is, the multimedia that we can enjoy. Um, and the next poet that I will invite to our Zoom room stage is Don Krieger, uh, the gracious host of our, our room here. Don Krieger is a biomedical researcher whose focus is the electrical activity within the brain. He's the author of the hybrid collection, Discovery, and is a 2020 Creative Nonfiction Foundation Science as Story Fellow. His work has appeared in Amer American Journal of Nursing, Neurology, Seneca Review, the Acai Shimbun, the Blue Nib, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and others, and has appeared in translation in Farsi. His website I'll post in the chat. John? Thank you. I have two. This one is in Beltway. Sunday Drive. I only need to show my face at work sometimes. Most of what I do is online. Since the bug, though, it's that way for almost everyone. We ping pong every other week, her place or mine four hours each way in my sealed car at 80, like a transport pod in Musk's hyperloop. But we have windows. Truck packs race in slow motion, shredded treads, bright fog, roadkill, tunnel mouth, cops at every overpass, glaring like the dazzling sun. Once we stopped in Breezewood for crackers, the manager was terrified. He checked each of us at the door for a mask and any hint that we had come for his head. Just this Friday, my office computer went down. I'm not essential, so I called someone who was to push the reset button. The grandbaby was born on Friday too. We drove up first thing Saturday, watched little Becky while dad helped mom in the hospital, then drove back four hours each way. Broken trees laid flat, cell towers and billboards, Jesus saves, fresh cracked eggs, 
hog barns, silos, keep America great. When will we reap the whirlwind? We're hoping mom and baby come home today and we're waiting two weeks to see if we got the bug or they did. Driving back, South Jersey was empty and dark as a closet. Some fool sat in the blind spot on my bumper for half an hour. We were frightened and enough is enough. I slowed to get his tag number. Not so easy since he slowed too. I turned on the dome light and dialed 911 as we passed him. Flags on every porch, church buses on cruise control, chain reaction pile up. Are you confused? Trust Jesus. 1-800-FOR-TRUTH. He bore off on an exit just then. Maybe the cops got him, maybe not. I wonder if he had a pistol and what would have happened had I. In the beginning, Lot's wife died nameless, not because she looked back, but for remembering. In a sweet vision, I lived naked, small trees, wide spaced, warm shade, rich with apricots, a white beach in view, gentle surf, a dark squall rushing across the water, a walled colossus to the south, massive piers, men of all shades at labor, oars and sails, slanted ships, long and low, bilge water and shackles, Babel, the towers at city center in flames, smoke and harbor stench, billowing silver in the sun, I have always longed to live simply in an orchard, figs and cedar, olives and almonds, ladders and baskets, gloves and fresh bread, each day time stretching to the evening cool. So many remember their past lives as princes, like them, I long for Eden, where tyranny and forgetting were new. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Two very, very powerful poems. Um, I just want to mention that Don has a, a YouTube channel as well, and uh, you should check it out. Uh, just Google Don Krieger and YouTube and you'll find it. And while you're doing that, Google uh, Indran and YouTube and you'll find the channel that I, I started as well, which is called the Poetry Channel, where Don has a poem and a number of others uh, in the room. If you don't have a poem, please get in touch with me because we'd like to make this uh, space, um, a community space on, a, on an international scale. Um, Talking about an international scale, the country of Chile has gone through a lot, just like all of the countries of the world. Uh, but it has also had some very good news in recent weeks when it's um, plebiscite, you know, the, the vote to change the constitution was approved and to develop a new constitution. From that country, which is of course the country where Pablo Neruda, Gabriel Mistral and and so many of our, our heroes and heroines come from, uh, we'll read now, um, America Merino. She's from Viña del Mar in Chile, a poet and translator. She has published the plaquette and will be the stars, a selection of, and translation of poems by the Italian writer, 
Antonio Pozzi, and the book of poetry Fractals, which was published in 2015. Her work has been featured in literary events in Latin America, in Europe, and the United States. Part of her work has been translated into French, English, and Italian. Very happy that she has contributed to the Weltway Poetry Quarterly. Um, and she asked me to read the translation uh, of one of the poems. Go ahead, America. Adelante, America. Which I Hola. Hola, muchas gracias, Indran. Gracias, Sara. Yo voy a hablar en español, pero Indran me va a traducir. Eh, quisiera también felicitar a, a Indran y a Sara por toda esta gestión, por el evento, por compartir con ustedes eh, tan destacados poetas. Es un honor para mí estar aquí. Y también los felicito por el lanzamiento de este nuevo número de, de la revista. Voy a leer solamente dos poemas de mi libro Fractales. Son poemas breves. Este es el primero. Y sin embargo, algo nos eleva, algo nos salva. La música de las utopías, quizás, el viento. No creerás en las santas señales, vas en dirección opuesta. El mundo es un oleaje atravesado por largos reflejos sin fondo, inundado en calma, como si lograras descifrar qué hay del otro lado, escribirás sobre el curso de las estrellas, sobre la belleza o la verdad, y traerás de regreso algo invisible, extraviado hace años en una onda fisura. Cuando envejezcas, sabrás por qué es necesaria la poesía, en tiempos asiagos. Y el segundo poema. Esta vez escoge los colores del cielo, una imagen pasajera. Las nubes y solo eso sobre mi país devastado. En el fondo de la noche permanecen únicamente la memoria y su inútil eternidad. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ti. Thank you very much, America. Um, and now I'll read the translations of these two lovely poems. Um, first one is, do not speak of beauty. Breaking, it translates into thirst. Do not drink water until dying. Do not observe the sky anymore. Clench your fists and resist the blow of the waves. And nevertheless, something raises us, something saves us. The music of utopias, perhaps the wind, you will not believe in the holy signs. You go in the opposite direction. The world is a tide pierced by long reflections, bottomless, flooded in calm as if you could decipher what's on the other side. You will write about the course of the stars, about beauty or the truth, and you will bring back something invisible, lost years ago in a deep fissure. When you get old, you will know why poetry is necessary in fateful times. And the second poem. This time chooses the colors of the sky, a passing image clouds and just that over my devastated country in the background of the night remains only memory and it's useless eternity i muchas gracias america thank you very much for these yeah, uh, yeah. Piercing yeah. Points. thank you okay well i think we're you know we're approaching um, our last readers and um, it's always a, a time of great emotion in these readings because uh, one doesn't want to stop. We have um, two, three, three more poets, I believe. Um, and if we can get any say back, we will as a long call at the end. Uh, let's see. Um, um. You're on. Okay, good. Daddy say, well, keep, let's, let's keep, uh, keep you, keep you as a designated hitter at the end. All right. To bring on that poem. Um, uh, Sarah, do you want to present the next point? 
Yes, next we have, uh, I don't want to mispronounce the name, Shirley Rivage, can you? Perfect, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Shirley Rivage um, studied theoretical and descriptive linguistics at the Faculty of Applied Linguistics in Haiti. Passionate about books, she's a librarian on the board of Plimay, an internet platform for which she directs at Monotaire, which I think is a uh, institution. She's also in charge of communications for Kimze. Uh, uh, Shirley, you, you correct me at the pronunciation on this, please. Kinzani de la Puese Feminine, uh, promoted by Lemay. She founded Banquet Poetica, a platform that promotes contemporary Haitian and international poetry. And uh, I will invite you to the mic. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't you're, know if you hear me. You're a little quiet. I don't know if you can turn up the sound on your computer or what you what you're using. Okay, let, let me let me try. Okay, now I increase the volume. It's okay now. Uh, no, est-ce que tu peux monter plus le volume, si tu peux? C'est ce que c'est ce que je viens de faire. Je ne sais pas si vous m'entendez. OK, oh, oui, nous, nous pouvons t'entendre, mais, mais ce n'est pas très fort, mais oh, c'est possible. We can hear you, but it's not very strong, OK? But it's what we will do. OK, OK, OK. I, I will try to talk more loud. Perfect, perfect, parfait, yeah. parfait. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so I, I, I say thank you first to England for this invitation, and I'm very happy and glad to, to take part of this great uh, manifestation about poetry. Um, I'm going to read for you uh, some of my poems. Uh, it's in French, <laughs> so I'm going to read them in French. Ville orpheline, conduite dans cette danse entrelacée entre corps et ombre. Je chante ton corps, corps à corps. À la je dessine tes lèvres photographiques, marge irréversible. Tu fus ma seule jadis. Énigme d'un nuit dans l'horizon des mots, je chatouille ma plume en force. Je trébuche. Je suis une feuille morte. Orgasme en tache d'encre, nuit froide, jour ensanglanté. Une litanie continuelle chuchotée dans une profondeur obscure. Blanche, blanche, comme une... I think we've lost connection. Yeah. Shirley, can you, tu peux nous écouter? No. I don't see her anymore in the... Uh. Okay. She's still she's still actually connected, but her microphone is not connected. Okay. Shelley's connecting to us from Haiti, from Port-au-Prince. Um, let's. Uh... Okay. I think she's back now. Shirley, malheureusement, la connexion n'est pas bonne. Uh, Est-ce que tu veux que je lise le, le poème français et, ou bien en anglais, la traduction? Can you hear? Don, do you see her still connected? Or? I do, but her, her, her microphone is not showing as connected. Adrian, can you uh, ask her to call in, maybe? And we can... Yeah, it, it, okay. you know, for, for whenever people have trouble connecting, there's dial-in information in the Zoom invitation. You can dial in as if to a conference call. And when you do that, you're using a whole uh -huh. different... That works very well. Okay. Yeah, but she's a, abroad in Haiti. It's hard to do that. From... They have international phone numbers in that 
in that oh, list. I see. Yeah. But is the charge to the call made in Haiti or is it made to the number you're calling? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I think what we have, and we also uh, have uh, to remember that we, we heard from the uh, Catherine and, and Jesse Lee earlier reading translation, but they also have a poem each of their own to, to share. So we'll, we'll also keep them um, in reserve to finish the reading with those two poems and the poem of Denise. All right. So, um, so next, uh, let me read the translation of one of Shirley's poems. Um, or would you like to hear a version of it in the original in French as well? Uh, let me know. I would like to hear it in French. You would. Uh, all right. I'll 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 do that then. Um, I'll read from the uh, from the journal uh, the poem we published. Uh, it's called "Tu as nu don mes rêves." Uh, which I translated as you walked naked in my dreams. Um, I'll read the French uh, original and then the, my translation. From Shirley Rivage. Tu as marché nu dans mes rêves et depuis tout est devenu interdit. Traîné de paroles qui se flanchent pour semer nos gestes d'amour à l'œil dévié d'un monde qui ne sait pas aimer. Nous sommes faites pour être libres, libres de s'aimer. Nous sommes faites pour s'aimer librement. T'aimer, c'est le mieux que je puisse faire toute ma vie. Rien d'autre. Je t'aime jusqu'à braver les interdits, puisque deux femmes ne peuvent pas s'aimer. Mais ça me suffit, une fois, et je te veux encore. Tu es le début et la fin de mes poèmes. Je ne veux plus de poèmes, car je t'ai je, je toi. Le jour viendra où les passants ramasseront chaque baiser qu'on a sémé sous la route. Ils verront que la porte tabac avec mon âme a guenouillé à tes pieds. Tes pieds, mes seuls et uniques repères. Les places publiques se feront témoins de notre oui et seront complices de nos joies. Et je t'aimerai au nom de toutes les églises, toi, ma croix, mon chapelet, mon adorable péché. Et cent mille autres, tu as marché dans mes rêves. Et depuis, la sexualité est devenue arc-en-ciel. Elle se fait et se défait. Naturel, son sexe, son nom, son pays, son culture, son couleur, son visage. Oui, tu as marché dans mes rêves, nu, et depuis j'ai appris à tout cacher. Des fêlures de lune jusqu'à ton riz libre et jeune, que j'ai caché sous mes bras pour que la tempête des interdits ne l'emporte pas, afin que toi et moi nous puissions s'aimer. Jusqu'à creuser de grands trous dans les silences endormis des mots. You walked naked in my dreams. Since then, everything has been prohibited. A drag of words that fall away. To sow our gestures of love in the diverted eye of a world that knows not how to love. We are made to be free, free to love each other, made to love each other freely, to love you is the best I can do with all my life, nothing else. I love you until I break through the thou shalt nots that a woman cannot love another woman. This is sufficient once, and I want you again. You are the beginning and the end of my poems. I don't want any more poems. I have you. The day will come when passers-by gather every kiss sowed on the roads. They will see that I carry your mark on its knees at your feet. Your feet are my only and unique marker. Public places will become witnesses to our relation. Yes, and they will be accomplices in our joys. And I will love you in the name of all the churches. You are my cross, my rosary, my adorable synth, and 100,000 others. You walked in my dreams, and since then, 
sexuality has become a rainbow. It is made and unmade, natural, without sex, without a name, without a country, without culture, without color, without a face. Yes, you walked in my dreams, naked, and afterwards I learned to hide everything from cracks of the moon to your smile, free and young. I hid under my arms so that the storm of forbiddens, forbidden does not take our love away, so that you and I, we can love each other until we dig big holes in the seeping silence of words. Shirley Rivash, thank you. Shirley's behalf, grand poem. Um, an honor uh, to translate it for the issue. Um, Sarah, all yours. I can go ahead and introduce Jorge. Jorge is that? Jorge um, Areta Sandoval is the next reader that we'll have. Um, tremendous poet. He's from Lima. Uh, I believe we're a couple of Peruvian poets. This issue. He's the editor in chief of the Peruvian publisher and bookseller Mesa Redondo. He's the author of the poetry book that discusses the Gaza Strip called La Fuerza Equiva Cada, 2012, uh, published both in 2012 and 15. The novel and fragments, his most read book is titled Amores Tontos, um, several dates published there. The book of myths, uh, Diosis, 2015 and 19. The book of stories, Morir en el Intento, 2017. And the poetry book in the style of love, uh, Abacedario, Cuando el Amor Escribe Dentro, which is published this year. He spends his days between teaching, editing, and designing books. And uh, I thank you all for bearing with my mispronunciation with all the talented <laughs> linguists on this meeting. Uh, and I welcome Mr. Jorge Sandoval to the stage. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jorge, estás ahí? Jorge Ureta Sandoval. ¿Me escuchas? Yo no te veo. My, I apologize. I don't know if, is he on the call? Don, do you see Jorge Ureta Sandoval? I do not. Uh, okay. Let me try to contact him separately. Um, thank you, Sarah, for introducing. I think I, I could also go to the poems and the issue, but let's, um, let me try to contact him. Meanwhile, um, Sarah, would you introduce the next poet? And I will be back in touch. Yeah. Thanks. This one, certain that I saw um, Ralph was here. Yes, Ralph James Savaris. Is that how you pronounce your last name, Ralph? Ralph, you need yes. to. Understand. Yes, that's good. Great. Um, Ralph James Savaris is the author of two books of prose, Reasonable People and See It Feelingly, and two volumes of poetry titled Republican Fathers and When This Is Over. And Ralph, you are. Yes, Th thank you so much for uh, publishing my work and for including me in this reading. I'm gonna read the poem that appears in uh, Beltway. It's about Calvin Coolidge, who was the 30th president of the United States from 1923 to 1929. And while he was president, his youngest son died playing tennis on the White House court with his older brother. And uh, Calvin Coolidge was a notoriously diffident man who, uh, who was completely destroyed by the death of his son. So the poem's called, O Calvin, O Calvin. A president so sour and uncommunicative, he looks as though he's been weaned on a pickle, quipped Alice Longsworth, eldest daughter of rough swinging Teddy Roosevelt, who built the first White House tennis court, a rolled dirt affair costing $2,000 and sitting where presidents now serve in the full moon obtrusion that has come to symbolize the presidency. The court lasted only seven years before Howard Taft, who much preferred golf, plowed it under. At 300 pounds, he could barely move. The second court lasted a good deal longer, long enough for the sons of Silent Cal. A man went the joke of two words, you lose, 
to play tennis on it long enough for one of them, Calvin Jr., to develop a blister on his big toe. He should have been wearing socks long enough for the infection to travel throughout his body as though by train, the way his father had from Vermont upon learning of Warren Harding's death. What a great country the human form is and its capital, the little Mount Hart. I try to picture Calvin Sr. in the White House garden, helpless, distraught, desperate to do something, anything really, as his son begins to fade. And so he catches a rabbit and brings it to Calvin Jr.'s room. Perhaps death, that other wordless thing, can be distracted. Perhaps it can even be delighted. The animal quivers, its delicate eyes beg for mercy. If love is a magician, then maybe it can pull a 16-year-old boy from the day's dark top hat. He'd send in the Navy if he could, the USS Penicillin. It isn't even in dry dock yet. When Calvin Jr. succumbs, Calvin Sr. is disconsolate, stroking his namesake's forehead and sobbing in public. As one reporter will put it, he wept unafraid, unashamed. He is like a shirt turned inside out. All of the stitching is now apparent. He'll wear a black arband for months, heraldic emblem of an effusive woe. He'll renounce presidential pomp, experiencing what psychologists call a dysphoric mood or major depressive episode. The resolute desk, like the ship from which it came, stuck in Arctic ice. Congressmen and cabinet members waddling like penguins around him. Call it fatherly love winning out in loss. A touching, if somewhat dire, paralysis. Not the failure that historians like to speak of. Not a dereliction of duty. No, the scrupulous fulfillment of another more basic one, governor of grief, chief executive of sorrow. Few politicians have the talent to move a bill through committee in the underworld. I honor you, Abe Lincoln, yet I've had enough of your nobility, prosecuting a war despite your own depression and the loss of Willie. Your will appalls me. Get on your mule and ride out of Washington. I want a man who falls to the occasion, who plummets completely, a man whom reason abandons. You can't have power and a son. You can't even have one of them for long, Calvin Sr. will conclude. I'm partial to such thinking and to the sport that underlies it. His very chair is perched on Roosevelt's old baseline. How the hero of San Juan Hill loved to peg the members of his tennis cabinet. His volley like a Gatling gun. Spiro Agnew, the future's seedy kickback. Yes, time, the great developer, must pay to play with lives, will bean his own doubles partner, prompting Tricky Dick to joke, he ought to conduct diplomacy in Cambodia with a racket. There's always darkness in a leader's strokes. The past is like some terrible pollutant. It gets into the groundwater. The present is like an East European forest where the animals have two heads and the vegetables are radioactive. For half a millennium, Richard III secretly ruled England from beneath a London car park. Think of him as directing traffic. When Calvin Sr. looks out the window, Calvin Jr. is still hitting backhands. He moves with the grace of a ghost, unfettered by limbs or gravity. And the, the next poem I'm going to read comes from my book that just came out. I want to share the cover with you. I hope you can see that. It's got quite a pandemic image on it. It's called When This Is Over. And this poem 
is titled Dante, I Need Your Help. And it's about another president I think you will recognize. If you Dante lovers will recall that Dante represents or depicts Satan um, in the lowest circle of hell, half frozen in ice. And the more he flaps his wings, the more he produces the ice that traps him. Dante, I need your help. And when he arrives in hell, there will be no people, just facts. A wall of them, like the guards at Buckingham Palace, fixed, unblinking, imperturbable. Or two walls, like the gauntlet at a coliseum when the gladiators are introduced, the lions nibbling on his legs. Truth, after all, is hungry. Or a wedding when the happy couple leaves the church and the rice suddenly becomes rock. Truth demands a stoning. Or the long tunnel of a frozen hospital when Satan, after weeks on a ventilator, is at last released, his wheelchair stuck in the ice. The facts with their little white coats line the corridor. Truth has no need for antibodies. He will be like a child with a million tops, none of which he can get to spin. There will be applause of sorts, joy, and memory will be the mask he must always wear. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, uh, I was I unmuted. I'd like to invite Catherine Jago to read now. Go ahead, Catherine. Hey, thank you. And uh, thanks to Sarah for sharing an unpublished poem. Um, I'm decided I'm gonna follow suit because I think many, if not all of us feel like the things that we were writing before this year um, suddenly seem um, pretty irrelevant with the many events that have been happening. So this, um, this poem is called Postcard from the Pandemic. Um, and there's a couple of references in it. Shropshire and Manchester are from the part of the country in, in England where I'm originally from, where the Industrial Revolution started and um, cotton was sent back there to run the mills. So postcard from the pandemic, um, June 23rd, 2020, Madison, Wisconsin. 100 days in lockdown, the sky studded with white clouds like the smoke rising in so many cities. The other night, protesters toppled Lady Forward, the white woman in a revealing robe, saluting manifest destiny in front of the white domed capital downtown. Here in our white neighborhood, the air is perfumed. Oh, the generosity of trees. Right now, lindens are flowering, sweet as white jasmine or mock orange. And looking up, the air is filled with specks of white. Moats, one might say. Cottonwood fluff floating free, ubiquitous as snow. And I'm out cycling, maskless, free, white, in the green hill country south of town. The cops don't stop me toiling in my voluntary sweat up slopes and swooping down them, savoring the fresh air in my face, breathing it deep, reminded for some reason of the sea. The winds from the northeast today off the Atlantic. I pass a barracoon of cattle clanking in their stanchions and the smell, the sound of those chains clinking bring to mind coffles, those human chattel driven south to feed King Cotton like so many head of stock, creating capital 
that lit the smelting fires in Shropshire, drove the mills in Manchester, built the vaulted capitals and even the White House, wealth that begat white wealth, a violence so intricate and ancient, its roots seem inextricable, malevolent and many tentacled, stubborn as cancer, relentless as the wind powering me home. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Sarah. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you for reading the unpublished work. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I just saw that that Jorge uh, Sandoval entered the room. So um, if he's ready, I would like to in, invite him to read. Jorge, okay. are, you, are you ready? Jorge, estás ahí? I admitted him. Sí, sí, estoy acá. Indran, okay. ¿cómo estás? Bien, Jorge. Tú puedes seguir ahora leer tus dos poemas y, y yo, si quieres, yo puedo leer las traducciones. Ya, ya perfecto. Ah, ya, ya, ya nos hemos presentado a ti. We have already presented you. Jorge Oreta Sandoval Rey is reading from Lima, uh, the heart of a lot of trouble at the moment. Uh, if you've been following the news where there was a constitutional coup. And um, so anyway, go ahead, Jorge. Adelante. Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, soy de Perú, Lima, exactamente. Y me gustaría leerles un poema que se llama Están Muertos. ¿Quiénes están muertos en realidad? Están muertos y no se dan cuenta. Están momificados y no lo perciben. Están sin respiración y no lo sienten. Muertos por la guerra. Momificados por la intolerancia. Sin respiración por la desdicha. Están partiendo al cielo o quizás al infierno. Están volando al limbo, están transportándose hacia la nada, están muertos y ya nadie los recuerda. Gracias. Y el otro poema cortito es Nóminas de Huesos. Cráneos norteamericanos, tibias españolas, metacarpios ingleses, homóplatos iraquíes, nóminas de huesos, explosiones, disparos, sangre, nóminas de huesos, venganza, guerra, muerte. Nóminas de huesos, mudez, ceguera, llanto, nómina de huesos. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Now I will read uh, the translations of the two poems. Uh, they both appeared in the issue of, uh, of Beltway. Um, uh, by the way, just to uh, mention, Jorge, besides being a, a, a poet, is a prolific prose writer as well, has written many books of uh, fiction, and uh, he's also the editor-in-chief of a publishing house, uh, Mesa Redonda, in, in Peru. Um, the first poem was called Están Muertos. The translation goes like this. They are dead. Who have died, really? They are dead, and they don't realize. They are mummified without perceiving their state. They do not breathe and do not feel. Dead owing to the war mummified for intolerance, without breath for misery. They are leaving for heaven or maybe to hell. They're flying in limbo. They're traveling towards the void. They are dead and already nobody remembers them. And then Nomina de Huesos, which uh, translated as payroll of bones. North American craniums, Spanish shin bones, English hand bones, Iraqi shoulder blades, payroll of bones, explosions, shots, blood, payroll of bones, shame, war, death, payroll of bones, struck dumb, blind, waiting, wailings, payroll of bones. Those poems Muy poderosas. Many thanks, Jorge, for those. And good luck in Lima. Good luck in Peru. I hope you'll stay safe. Um, muchas, muchas gracias, Indran, por la invitación. Y gracias. qué bueno compartir con poetas de, de, todo, de, todo, bueno, de todo el mundo. ¿no? En estos momentos, no sé si estarán enterados que en el Perú vivimos una sesión muy difícil. 
el Congreso de la República acá en el Perú, uno de los estados han, ha vacado al presidente que tenemos, entonces eh, nunca, nunca estamos, nunca eh, Perú hace, bueno, de los cien, vamos a cumplir 200 años la el próximo año y nunca estamos bien, ¿no? Siempre el tema de la política nos, nos duele. Este lo año lo escribí cuando estábamos en, la, en el golpe de dictadura de Fujimori, el, el último dictador que tenemos, eh, lo escribí muy joven a los 17 años, 15 años, entre 15 y 17 escribí este poemario, llama La Fuerza Equivocada, que habla sobre la franja de Gaza netamente. Entonces, es, me pongo muy contento de, de leer estos textos, sobre todo para, para personas que se dedican a la poesía, que están en la poesía y que son ejemplos, ¿no? Para, para una persona joven, bueno, todavía tengo 33 años, así que para una persona joven como yo, ¿no? Muchas gracias por la invitación. Let, let me just give you a very rough tra translation of what he just said. He's talking about the constitutional coup that just took place in Perú, the situation which is very uh, chaotic and, and uh, uncertain at the moment in the country. There's a lot of anger against the cost and this, what they're calling it is a coup. And uh, he's reminded of when he was 15 or 16 and started to write the poems that became La Vivocada, those from which those two poems uh, I, were included in Lord Beltway. And that they, they were written at the time about Alberto Fujimori's dictatorship in Peru. And here we are again, he's now 33 years old and he's living times that remind him of that uh, of that earlier uh, dark period in the country's uh, history. So um, I, I told him, be, be careful. What can we say, but be careful and take care. Muchas gracias, Jorge. And now, uh, Sarah, would you like to introduce the next? Muchas gracias, muchas gracias a ti, Indran, muchas gracias. Okay. I saw Jorge was trying to speak again. Um, I think Jesse, Jesse Lee Kirchival was going to be the next reader you have reading. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks. I, I, I didn't know I was going to be reading a poem, but I will. And um, um, I wanted to read one. This is the title poem from a, a, I have a selected poems that just came out in Argentina yesterday. Um, and the title there is uh, La Crisis is el Cuerpo. And um, translated the poem, the book is translated by Ezekiel Seidenberg. And I'm in the situation that Luis is. I, I, my, my book is in, in Argentina and I, I, I can't have a copy of it. I don't have a copy of it, but I'll read the poem. The crisis is the body. Now that you are sick again, I know where to find you. Body folded into the hollows of the couch, hand under your head, face in shadow, like a marsh wren or a sedge wren in a nest of dry and woven grass. How is it, I want to know, that the abstraction we call God decides these things? Did he point a finger at your side and plant something there, lumpy, imperfect, growing like some sinister potato? After your treatments, those imperfect inoculations against death, you sleep, infused, hairless. I see your eyes close. I see you walk into yourself, thief that you are, taking my life with you. Before you got sick, I used to pray, anyone but him, God. You can see how much good that did. Now, what more is there to say? Thanks. Bravo, Yasini, thank you. Um, uh, you know, Sarah and I are editing this thing together, so I don't know who should introduce the last one, but anyway, I'll say a couple of words again. Danny, say, are you connected? No. Right, did he say? Yes. Okay. Nusalo, uh, well, you're going to be the last reader with that poem you were reading earlier, which got interrupted. Um, go ahead, Denise. Merci. Uh, I continue where I stop or start over. I think you should start over and just read the poem through. Okay. Does everybody agree? I okay. The melody. Le cauchemar des feuilles. Les œufs contenant les vermines triangulaires sont éclos. Les nouveaux monstres de l'histoire tournent, tournent en rond, braquant leurs angles terminalistes sur les aubes des plus beaux boutons de rose. Maudit de soi cette nuit, où le cosmos en route a avalé nos spermes fatales, 
et maudite soit cette cervelle naïve qui a procédé à la déténébration du terrible rejeton. Il a accouché la synthèse des fous, le triangle des démons, la conification de l'enfer. Les déserts brûleront et resteront déserts, mais qui racontera le cauchemar des feuilles Tourne, tourne, météore d'amour, au magnétisme irrésistible, sorti on ne sait où des ténèbres, tu éternises la plainte des rocs, les soubresauts des abîmes, et c'est certain que tu éterniseras les hurlements effrayants de la dernière torche animale. Tourne, tourne, et pour les millénaires du silence, retiens aussi le cauchemar des feuilles. Si le papillon se remue trop dans ses rêves, si la rosée est un peu trop druide, si la brise du soir est un peu trop forte, l'aube nous trouve feuilles tombées. Si l'oiseau sur la branche bat trop ses ailes, si la pluie est trop abondante, si le vent se met un peu en colère, l'aube nous trouve feuilles éparpillées. Au premier souffle frigide de l'automne, à la tombée du premier flocon de neige, avant même le premier gel, nous sommes déjà feuilles mortes. Si le ciel devient sec pendant deux ou trois jours, si les rayons du soleil sont en érection d'un jour à l'autre, et si la foudre, comme un orgasme électrocuteur, nous frôle, nous sommes déjà feuilles brûlées. Quand les fleuves seront des fournaises roulantes, quand l'atmosphère sera un immense voile de feu, quand les océans seront des abîmes bouillonnants, qu'adviendra-t-il de nous Nous, les plus fragiles, nourrissons de la terre. Le cauchemar des feuilles, nightmare of the leaves. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Denise. I'm I glad you I don't know if Denise wants to read the shorter poem that we had prepared um, or if we should end there. Denise, did you want to read prologue? Prologue. Yeah. At the very beginning of. Les lunes d'or. Non, si c'est pas prêt, c'est pas la peine. Mon ami dit, ici le matin, là l'après-midi, une épine dressée pour chaque pupille de la nuit. Où sont ses lignes Lui, ombre du cactus aux lunes écarlates, dont la tige s'apaise de sable miroitant, de soleil écrasant, de souffle brûlant, d'urine de scorpion et de vipère, où sont ces lignes? Silence mortel et le mirage reculant, les aurait-ils engloutis malgré leur redoutable d'art? Où sont ces lignes? 
Okay. Beautiful. And this is the English prologue. <coughs> Death at noon, here the morning, there the afternoon, a thorn sticking out for each pupil of the night. Where are the moons? For him, shade of the cactus, whose stem subsides from gleaming sand, from crushing suns, from br burning breaths, from scorpions and vipers urine. Where are the moons? Could the mortal silence and the repeating mirages have swallowed them up despite their dreaded stingers? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Denise. Muchas gracias a todos. Merci beaucoup, Sarah. It's been wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we should close now with a little uh, few words of whatever, or just we'll close and look forward to the next one on the 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Another set of grain poets um, who were published in the issue and uh, really appreciate all of you who've also been published in the issue but uh, did not read today who, who were with us through this reading and um, looking forward to to meeting you again if you can come back on Saturday the 21st and check out the YouTube channels and uh, keep writing. Thank you for organizing Indran. Thank you, Nessie. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Sarah, for everything. Thank you.